Good evening. Uh, tonight, this is the Appropriations Committee uh, meeting. And uh, tonight on our agenda, we do have first an open forum for any public, anyone from the public who wants to step forward. Uh, then we have approval of meeting minutes, budget review. Tonight, we have uh, Parks and Recreation. Delphi is here. Um, we have the town meeting report. Uh, we'll have some discussion on that later. And then, uh, then we'll be able to adjourn. Uh, so I don't think there's anyone here who wants to come up and say anything. So I think we're on to item two. Um, I don't believe we have any uh, meeting minutes to approve tonight. No. So I don't think we have any additional ones that are ready. So we'll go on. We're uh, ready for our budget review. So uh, we have uh, Parks and Recreation here. And thank you for coming, Jay. Sure. And uh, did you say you also... Uh, Ben, do you also have hard copies of the... Uh, uh, Jay, Jay has them. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I can do that, Jay. So I do think there's also uh, soft copies sent out. Do you want to go that way? Yeah. The font's a little small, on. guys. Right, yes, I apologize I for that. Thank you. 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 So if you don't mind, I'll just make a few comments before we get going here. Sure. Um, I'm sure the first thing that you guys are going to notice is that the um, the um, the number of the uh, I call it a, a general fund subsidy um, went up from 127 to 148 this year. Largely, that is due to a um, a pretty significant uh, personnel cost adjustment that the town made last year. Um, which is a little uh, uncomfortable for me to talk about publicly, but basically um, the town did a review and the um, director's salary was uh, significantly increased as a result of being in compliance with uh, State Department of Revenue standards for salaries um, for the position. So that was a, a pretty significant increase in, in uh, personnel costs, which is basically the entirety of the uh, the increase in the general fund. Um, Which of the sheets are you going to speak from first? This one. Okay, this, one. this is really the most important one. I included an analysis sheet that sort of breaks it down in a slightly different way. And, and the two sheets, I apologize, they don't exactly reconcile perfectly because um, I know the town had to make some adjustments to the um, debt service and to indirect costs. So they don't, they don't reconcile perfectly I think it's off by five or six hundred dollars but some things uh, some other things I wanted to talk about we do have um, some revenue opportunities coming up this year we expanded our um, summer uh, playground groups we extended the hours from 3:30 to 5:30 to sort of help uh, working families who can't get out of work early um, that was one of the things that we received a lot of feedback about that in the past couple of years so we went ahead and expanded that program and increased the fee. Um, so now you have two options. You can, you can go with the old playground group, which gets out of 330 for, I think, $190, or go extended for $250. And we're already seeing a lot of enrollment for the extended. So I anticipate a, a good increase in, in revenue for that particular program. Um, you know, we also started a cricket league this year with uh, some really enthusiastic uh, members of the community that I, I had no idea how. Um, <laughs> it's a religious experience, apparently, for a lot of people. So we built a cricket pitch in the, um, over in Fruit Street on the grass, and we have two, actually two leagues that play there on weekends. So we're going to get a little bit, we're going to see a, a little bit more revenue for Fruit Street, probably between ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. When you were building it, did you hear voices? They will come. <laughs> <laughs> no, basically, we had some we had some really enthusiastic uh, guys come to a meeting and say, pretty much that thing. If you build a real pitch, you'll have real interest, and yes, they will come, and they did. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So yeah. it's 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 a nice uh, it's a nice new program for for the department and actually for the, for the whole town. It's been it's been pretty successful. Yeah, it's great, and it has got a good reputation already. I'm hearing. I used to go to Acton actually to play cricket, so now I can play in home ground. <laughs> yeah, and there's I guess there's a there's a soft tennis ball league. 
yeah. and there's the hard leather ball league, and I, from what I understand, those are two very different things. So, um, yeah, it's been a it's been a big success. We're seeing a big increase in, um, as you guys probably know, as as padded contact football becomes less popular, non-contact football is becoming much more popular. So we're starting to see a big increase in our registration for flag football. So th that's growing. And I, I anticipate that growing to continue to grow over the next several years. Um, another significant change in the way we're sort of recording things this year, and as, as Dave came on board um, this past year, uh, Dave's been very supportive and helpful in, in helping us understand a lot more of the uh, rules and regulations for the Department of Revenue. So in the past, and stop me if I'm not explaining this correctly, uh, Dave, in the past, we have partnerships with a lot of outside vendors who provide programs. For example, Babe Ruth Baseball. Um, we have a gymnastics program that we work with with an outside partner. And in the past, we have collected all the registration fees for those programs. We've taken out our, our administrative fee and any field use fees or expenses that we incur, and then we pay them the net proceeds. In the past, we would record all of those revenue, all of those registration receipts as revenue, and then we'd recall, we, would, we would record all of the disbursements as expenses. Um, what we're doing now is we are creating um, a, a liability on a balance sheet instead. So as we bring in these, re these registration fees, we're setting it up as a liability. Am I correct, Dave? Well, That's characterizing that? So we're setting up a liability on a balance sheet. And then as we disperse the funds, we reduce that liability. And then the net, our administration fee and any other um, associated fees are recorded as revenue. True revenue. So, in, true revenue. so, so instead of recording $10,000 in revenue and $9,000 in expenses, we're just recording $1,000 in revenue and the, the rest is, is a balance sheet item. Mm -hmm. It's liability and cash. Does that does make that, sense? Does that carry over fiscal years? It, from a timing standpoint, it, it really is not significant. Okay. The, the liability is sitting on the books just because we're, we're saying that the, that the money is not truly ours. And, and, and it's full capacity because of the partnership agreement mm -hmm. that they have, which is a written agreement. By Correct. Them. Correct. And so, so um, what ends up happening is that just because of timing, that works, we're still collecting the registrations beyond June 30th, which is the end of our fiscal year. It would just carry over to the next year. Okay. But it's, the, the, it's what was collected after, after June? That's correct. Okay. Do we have any exposure from past years? No? I don't believe so. But if you look at the total revenues from 19 to, to 20, you'll see it goes from 592 to 522. That That's $70,000 reduction is a result of of the new way that we're going to record that and you'll see uh, um, on the on the expenses it's pretty much the same um, we built a new as you guys know we built a new facility over at fruit street indoor bathrooms um, storage uh, a covered sort of patio i, I guess um, we've, we're going to incur some new expenses on that but we feel like the new revenue from cricket is offsetting that mostly. And we've also just recently um, contracted a um, concession proprietor that's going to cook food and serve food, and we're going to share in the revenue with that as well to offset some of our costs. But, um, and, and Dan, jump in here anytime. We felt like to maximize that building and the investment the town made that we do want to, people need to be able to get a hot dog and a Gatorade when they're down there. So we, we wanted to provide that service. Is that? Okay. And another another significant. There's a minimum wage increase this year, from eleven dollars to twelve. That affects our personal costs as well for our seasonal employees. So our our, our counselors are now making it's the best job in the world. If you ask me, you're working twenty thirty hours a week at twelve bucks an hour at sixteen years old. It's uh, and we employ a lot of kids, which is nice. That cost went up a little bit. I have a question. 
and it, it could be I, I just can't recall but the new athletic the turf fields in uh, at the high school sure we was Parks and Rec going to take advantage of using that field too, or was that strictly yes. for the school? Yes. So it, it, there's no effect on our enterprise fund. We we basically have set up, and Dan could probably explain this a little better. We set up a field replacement <coughs> fund. Mm -hmm. So the revenues and expenses that run through that field are, are going through that those accounts. So it's separate from our um, from our enterprise fund, but we are we are responsible for generating the revenue, the external revenue for those fields. But, so, but some parks and rec programs will be run on those fields mm -hmm. at times and, and um, we'll be pricing in such a way that we're, we're actually paying into the fund. I, I, uh, so the revenue will not show, it doesn't show up. I it. actually think that that revenue is, is all in, in a, in a um, specific fund of the schools. Okay. So, so we, we won't touch any of that revenue. We're just helping managing it and helping, uh, uh, I guess, administer the the MOU that, that we put in place in order to build the fields. There's, some, there's a lot of oversight on that. I believe Tim is now part of that committee as well to sort of oversee the, um, the operational expenses and, and revenues that flow through there. But, but yeah, one of the things I'm actually concerned about, not so much that, but, but center school, um, I've built a significant piece of this budget, revenue and expense, mostly revenue, on running programs at center school in fiscal year 2020. Um, one of the things that concerns me is that we've recently discovered that there's, there could be an issue with air quality in there and with the ongoing heating system that seems to um, be failing on a regular basis. So one of the things that concerns me going forward for next year is if I can't run programs in the center school gym, I'm gonna have to run them in the schools, which is gonna increase my expense. Mm -hmm. Because we pay, I think, $15 an hour for for uh, school gyms and for the high school athletic center, I think it's forty or fifty dollars an hour. So that could be some. That could be a, an unforeseen expense that I have to incur. So are there any programs at the marathon school right now? Um, no. Well, yes. Um, rec basketball. I know that rec, um, town rec basketball. We're running practices and games at the marathon school. But for this year, most of what we did is we were able to um, keep keep center school in condition that we could run run programs in there that had been run there in the past. Um, but uh, Dave Del Torrio and company did a great job of, of uh, keeping enough Band-Aids on that to, to keep it in acceptable condition. Uh, like Jay said, I think there's a concern that, that uh, it might drop to unacceptable in the fall and, and therefore we'll see We'll have, to, we'll have a different different expenses associated with programs. Okay, I understand. Uh, I was just wondering if there was a backup plan. That's why I asked. There's a backup. We'll, there's a backup plan. We'll have. We'll. we'll um, we have a guy in town who's kind of the, the Mr. Basketball of Hopkinton. You guys probably know Jerry Spar. I don't know if anyone knows Jerry, but Jerry uh, is really good at maneuvering practices yeah. and and figuring that stuff out. So yeah, there'll be gym space and kids will play. But it, but it's nice to have. To be quite honest, it's nice to have a gym that I don't have to pay any fees on. Well, um, yeah. So that's so that's my question. Is I mean, it sounds like finding a gym. You're not too concerned with that. We'll find the but, gym, but the cost. We'll have to pay for it. I mean, I like to think, and I know that this is simplistic, but I like to think that you know we always talk about one town, one solution, and you know it's really taking taking the town's money out of one pocket and putting it in another when we're talking about using the schools. But are there actual Increased costs, increased costs. Um, you know, like I don't know, are janitorial fees higher and things exactly. like that? That exactly. So we're, I think Jay can speak to this, but I think we're able to run center school with just a kind of on a reactive basis when it yeah. comes to, to yeah. going and doing that. And I think the uh, the staff that maintains the the schools, the, the properties that are owned by the schools, are have got specific contracts in place. So there's minimum right. time frames and, right. and all that. You can't or just send a school. You can go unlock one door, let people in the gym. Yeah, and, and then and then and then empty the trash barrels on Monday. Yeah, yeah, got it. Which is nice. Yeah. Um, you know, in a perfect world, I wouldn't have to pay. I don't. I'm just, I still. I'm never going to understand why one town department pays enough town department a fee <laughs> to use a gym, but that's above my pay grade. So, so to, to that end, Todd, though, that there's, there's uh, at least 
30 something thousand dollars in the budget that that, that, that are into department transfers to yeah. for, for the fine work that DPW does uh, for us mm -hmm. and and finally I wanted to comment if you look at the bottom you'll see a, um, a reserve for extraordinary and unforeseen expenditures for twenty five thousand dollars it's not an enterprise fund um, budget expense but we determined after after a few things happened over the past year specifically with vandalism we would like to have a reserve to be able to to take that on as it occurs rather than having to wait for another budget cycle you know we don't want to operate that way so for example when um at reed park last year and someone went down and vandalized the bathhouse and you know it, it was a twelve thousand dollar expense to fix that i didn't have it you know and, and the, the thing about an enterprise fund that's it's very rigid when you're out of money you're out of money there's there's no way to to get around that so <laughs> Dave am I am I correct in that assessment well, yes Mostly. yeah so we came up with the idea to have this fund and again with two layers of oversight so before I can spend any money out of this it has to be approved by the Parks and Rec Commission and then before the money can actually be dispersed, town finance would have to also understand what we're doing and why. So that'll be an article of town meeting, right? I don't believe so, Dave, right? No, um, no it can all be in your regular enterprise. A regular enterprise, okay. It's just a okay. separate line. So that's it. You're, you're going to be using it, you're going to be funding it from retained earnings rather than estimated receipts. So you have to specify it. Yeah. Okay. We talked as a commission. We talked about uh, look, looking for some sort of a, a, a support from the town to, to for, for unanticipated things. I know other departments uh, generate free cash through the year, and, the, and they end up with some flexibility. But we thought that since we did have a, uh, a, a retained earnings, if, if you will, that, that we could take it out of that and just set it aside for that reason. Pick twenty five thousand dollars because we didn't want it to be a, uh, too significant of an amount, and we like the idea that there's there's a lot of oversight between uh, Jay and the commission, and also the the town finance department to make sure that um, it, it isn't a cookie jar that we're going back to. I you know Dan, I know you and I talked about this. I think it was last summer. Uh, where it might have been the vandalism or maybe a hot water heater or some maybe the hot water heater was just an example mm -hmm. that you were giving I fully think that you know that kind of thing should exactly. have some fund to be addressed is, is this something that could be addressed through facilities though or, or uh, is there something that stops facilities money from going over to parks and rec so so the the answer is um, it depends who has ownership uh, and in reality is who's responsible for repairing the up unless there's a, a, a verbal or a written agreement between the parties to do something. okay so the reasoning is that the is because the park and rec water and sewer enterprise funds are operated as a quasi business operation mm -hmm. so the DOI statement is that you have to track all revenue all inflows all outflows mm -hmm. revenue and expenses so it doesn't matter that it's town or mm -hmm. the whole they're actually separate mm -hmm. from from operating a, they in a sense that uh, they have to record every transaction, whether it's internal within the town or external or whatever, where internally we could have indirect costs, informal indirect cost agreement okay. that says we're going to cover this, you cover that, and that's a wash. Um, the enterprise funds have to do things so that they're recording every transaction. Okay. Yeah, okay. May I add that the, the, the commission also felt like um, you know, give, given the way the chart is written and, and what our responsibilities are as, as a Parks and Rec Commission, we felt like 
we should have oversight over this type of thing and it shouldn't need to go through a whole bunch of committees in order to deal with an emergency we've, we've written this in such a way that that we're not going to go out and buy new uniforms for yeah. Little League with yeah. this money yeah. it's it, it's really just so that we can meet on a regular basis and vote on it and, J, and it, after Jay kind of vets that it's a, an acceptable expense and and move forward and, and address the problem and not have to vote on it and then wait for a or a selectman's meeting and then wait and wait and wait yeah and I'm thinking I'm thinking more from the standpoint of uh, centralization of similar expenses um, you know yeah, there's a pretty small number yeah. absolutely absolutely um, you know I just think of you know vandalism on town hall vandalism at Reed Park you know how much do we spend on vandalism this year yeah. <laughs> you know right. that kind of thing but yeah. I'm just curious about the managing it's more as a PNL that's why you have your own reserve so it ties to you yeah and I and I, I believe that the spirit of this is that if if we spent ten thousand dollars of it during fiscal 20 we'd be back in the 2021 budget to kind of to to, to 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 address it to to, to, to replenish it it um, yeah, certainly that's true um, the the, you still have to make sure that you can maintain your revenue levels along those lines and, and or your subsidies. Yep. Okay. So, so this was the conversation I wanted to have where I didn't quite understand. So uh, is there $25,000 in the account in, in the enterprise fund right now? Or do we have to fund, are we funding that? It's right So yeah, yes, like it has yeah. to be. Um, of June uh, June 30th 2018 um, balances for all enterprise funds um, it just like the town has free cash right um, in the enterprise funds they call it certified retained earnings yes it gets certified by the Department of Revenue just like our own journal fund free cash and so that is available to be spent and appropriate I'm sorry appropriated <coughs> and spent okay so that's the final line in the in the document that says the use of the certified retained earnings which is twenty five thousand dollars and the moving forward if you have to spend into that then that'll be in the following year's budget to replenish that I guess. yep so we'll be allocating this twenty five thousand from retained earnings to a reserve so that's correct okay yes and Dave is, is this the only department that's doing it or we have other um, similar this, so the only one that will be able to do it is the enterprise fund. The town already has a reserve fund that, that exists under um, your committee. Um, and it's budgeted for 125000 and has been historically. Right, and that covers everything else. That covers the rest of the town. Yeah. Except for water sewer though, right? Because they're enterprise. It's, except for the enterprise fund. Do they have one? A reserve? Um, they don't. They they haven't come forward okay. and asked for us to create one. And the reason and so retained earnings as a funding source has to be appropriated. Okay, so it's just because the money's there doesn't mean they can spend. Okay, and so um, as as a source, so for the for their FY twenty budget historically. What happens is they're anticipating revenues, okay, and so they've done so. They they found they've anticipated their revenues now, and now they said on top of that they wanted to create a reserve. So they got locked into what their revenues were, what their expenses were, and now we need a. They said they need another twenty five thousand dollars to establish this reserve. So the only source available is if they have the money on hand. Okay, and that's and that's what they're doing. They're saying we have it in our certified retained earnings. We're going to appropriate it to be spent potentially from into this reserve fund. So, in a parks and recreation organization, any of my colleagues will tell you as well. Anticipating revenues is a lot easier than anticipating expenses when you're managing facilities, because there's just things that that happen lightning strikes and you have to replace what you know so this gives us it gives me a little bit of peace of mind really is what it does 
so that I can address things presently rather than having to, to wait, as Dan said. Yeah. And I'm just uh, <coughs> curious to know, uh, what happened to the vandalism? Do we have cameras or did you have any follow up? So uh, that's a good point. We, we, did, we are going to install cameras at Sandy Beach probably in the next month or two. Uh, I'm working with the town IT department on that. We had um, some money that we got through CPC for that purpose. So we are going to run, we are going to do that. We're first going to do Sandy Beach, then I think I'd like to do Fruit Street, then I think I'd like to do EMC, because we are going to invest in a new playground up there as well this fall. So yeah, unfortunately we, we will have to install hmm. security cameras because things happen. Makes sense. Yep. Jay, I had some um, questions just on under the revenue side. And sure. Maybe your comment about how we're recognizing the revenue and all that answers some of this, and maybe not. Um, first of all, I mean, I'm looking at the boat permit line, yep. and that seems like it's all over the place. It is. Um, why? <laughs> people did, just did we really only people, have $50 worth of revenue in, uh, in So what's, what's happening is people are coming down and they're writing check. They're writing one check for their beach pass and their boat pass. So in the office, the ladies are, you know, they're receiving that check and we're depositing it. And I'm not, sh you know, I actually would like to eliminate the separation of boat and beach and just consider it Sandy Beach revenue mm -hmm. because it's, it's really becoming difficult to, to differentiate between the two. Um, the other thing is people have figured out that you can launch your boat and then go take your trailer down to stop to uh, the price chopper and not have to leave it there. So that's what people are doing. Um, we're just, so they're just not buying permits? We're not selling a lot of permits, and <laughs> most of the people in town who are getting them are over 65, and they're free. So, you know, that's just the policy. Same with the beach passes. Yeah. So um, we sell all our beach passes between May 31st and July 15th. Yeah, basically. So we know, but yeah, it's, it's, it's. Does that make sense to to hire one of those twelve dollar an hour high school kids just to, you know, look at passes before people launch? Boats? We have them down there. Oh, you do. We do. Okay. We have parking lot attendants and we have lifeguards. Um, and the parking, you can buy a beach pass at the beach, and then twice a day I come down and I collect the cash, okay. and I deposit it. Um, but yeah, we if we don't have parking lot attendants at the beach. We will have 400 people there from neighboring towns mm -hmm. by 1:30. I think with Jay's suggestions, we check people before they. We we check and see if trailers are parked legally, as opposed to whether someone is launching a boat has a pass right. to to have a trailer. It's a, and and I mean I'll speak for Jay. I, I think that that we do like employ, em, employing those high school students, and uh, I'm not sure that they're prepared to be all that. Um, uh, aggressive towards someone that's doing that right. and I, I while there's probably some abuse I, I don't see a lot of tra trailers parked at price chopper like Jay talks about I think we might spend uh, hundreds and get hundreds back yeah yeah it's yeah. just um, so one of the other um, one of the other lines here that is way off from prior years is the other revenue right and that's that's a reflection of how we're recording revenue going forward okay that's that's the difference the other revenue is basically third party um third party agreements that we have with with uh companies and individuals that provide programs so so um on a lot of these i see that in 2018 we budgeted one number then the actual from 2018 you know, some of them are pretty close. Some of them are pretty far off. And then the budget for 2019 often seems to almost disregard if we were far off in 2018. Um, and then we see the budget for 2020 being similar to 2019. Do we know that we're tracking relatively close to 2019 numbers, or how are we getting to the 2020 numbers? I, I do look at actuals, Todd, but I look at actuals from the past three or four years and see if there's a trend. Yeah. So, and, and programs come and programs go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we used to have a very, very robust Babe Ruth program and a very, very robust ski program. Those have both kind of deteriorated over the years. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's still hard to predict it perfectly. Um, but what I but try for a smoothing and rather than just reacting yeah. to last year. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Um, 
and I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to hit the big target rather than the individual targets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you know, another example in town girls lacrosse used to be a parks and rec program they're no longer a parks and rec program they went off on their own so and that that occurred after i did my budget or during my budget so it's it gets hard sometimes the other revenue um other parks and revenue other parks and rec programs and other revenues they're the hardest ones they really are the hardest ones to predict um but usually we're, we're we've been pretty accurate with predicting total revenues mm -hmm. Um, you know, this year's a little different because we're going to be recording it differently. So I'm, you know, I have some reservations, and but we'll we'll figure it out. Yeah. All right. Operationally, you. though, we're we're happy with where we're at. Um, we still have a lot of we have we have every kid in town is participating in one way or another in our programming. Um, we're getting more adults. We're starting to get more seniors. Um, I'm going to start to see with the hiring of a new senior center director, um, a full library staff, we're going to start to do some programming together, which I think is going to be great both for us and for the community. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we're pretty excited. Great. See what my, we'll see what the commission looks like in, in May, but <laughs> I'm still pretty excited. Has the pickleball uh, craze hit here yet? We, we have... The pickleball people are chomping at the bit. The problem is the place that you have to line a gym for pickleball specifically. Right. So we wanted to do that in center school. We just can't pull the trigger yet because we just don't know what we're doing with center school. Um, but yeah, I'm working with Amy on pickleball and I'm working with the cricket guys on badminton. Okay. Because cricket and bad, from what I understand, cricket's in, in the outside and the people who play cricket also like badminton in, in the winter. So we're working on that too. Great. I think we could get a pretty significant badminton program going in town. That'd be great. You're planning for indoor badminton? Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. 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 So right. I think it's just a little bit. We're in a little bit of a holding pattern with center school on that stuff. I was going to ask. Uh, certainly, you have made significant progress on the revenue side over the last three, four years that we have seen. So that's yeah. that's a great job, I think. Uh, yeah. And I was just going to look for opportunities. What, have you measured like what's your utilization on the Fruit Street uh, and some of the other facilities, and where you see, you know, some more room to grow the revenues? Fruit Street is tough because we have a partnership with Hop Continued Soccer. Hmm. So during the peak times, they really have custody of the field. Not, not custody, but they 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 have first opportunity to use the fields, and they have twelve hundred kids in their program so really from April through the middle of June and from Labor Day through the middle of November it's a soccer field for the most part it's tough you know we, we get some what's left of youth football we get a little bit of cricket mm -hmm. but it is tough in those months to find opportunities for our programming we're hoping to get more of our programming on the new field at the high school so there's opportunities there okay. unfortunately though those revenues aren't going to be in our enterprise fund they're going to go to the to the high school field replacement fund, oh, but it's still opportunity. The most opportunity I see is in center school. If if the town makes the commitment to refurbish center school, to make that gym and that facility a true rec center, I, I anticipate after school programming, ping pong, tutoring, um, sort of like a Y, or a place for maybe middle school kids to come after school, spend a couple of hours and hang out. Um, and I, I think that's a good opportunity for us because I think that's an age group in town that's not really being serviced as well as some of the other age groups. That's where I see the biggest opportunity. It's not in lacrosse and baseball and other stuff because those sports are kind of owned now by the private sector. Um, that's big business. Mm -hmm. And uh, we provide basically an intramural alternative to that for, for kids who maybe aren't as serious about their lacrosse or their basketball, but they still want to play. Right. Um, so you mentioned possibly using the high school fields, and any revenue from that would go to the to the high school field replacement correct. fund. Will you incur any costs in supporting that? No, because okay. the, the cost it, it's it, there's two accounts: a revenue account and expense account. Yeah. So any expenses that are incurred there run through that expense. 
it's basically like you a went through the high school placement field. Correct. Okay. We are, even when we when we run a program at Fruit Street, if if it's a Parks and Rec program where people are uh, look girls lacrosse, two years ago would be an example of this. We're, we're still transferring money to to the uh, Fruit Street replacement fund for the hours that the that the program uses it. So, so they're paying an in, in town rate. I think what Jay's talking, or what, what you're asking, is we, we would price a program so that there was a field rental fee, where aligning the rental fees the same, whether it's the 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 um, the facility that Parks and Rec controls solely, Fruit Street, mm -hmm. or it's it's the one that that is controlled by the school or, or the by, by by the group that kind of um, is is tasked with managing that. So rates will be the same. It's just an expense on the on the program. That, all right, Jack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I write <coughs> checks. Like I said, during April and May, I write checks to Hopkins Indian Soccer for field use fees because they collect they collect um, field use revenue during those months. So the goal being, we're going to have to replace that field in four years. We need to build up some money to do that so that we don't have to come here and ask you guys for uh, a million dollars. <laughs> That's good. It's revenue overall for the town. Uh, but um, for your financials, it would probably help if you have some cut from that. But yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, now, going back to the uh, programs, uh, the high school ones and others, I think uh, certainly you might have more opportunities, especially going on the cricket side and badminton side, that there are the fields are scarce. So now that we have these assets, uh, you may look into you know more tournaments or more collaborative with other clubs around. And, and I've been encouraging the cricket enthusiasts to start really thinking about the parcel on East Main Street over by Legacy. Mm -hmm. That is a big parcel of land that has been designated for open recreation. So I think at some point the town's going to figure out how to access that property and at some point something's going to be built over there and I don't see why it shouldn't be a cricket pitch. Um, that's my own slant on that mm -hmm. but I know that there is a very um, there's a strong desire for for space to play cricket on and it requires a lot of space <laughs> you know, cricket it's big mm -hmm. um, it requires a lot of space so I was encouraging those cric those those people to really really pursue that but for, <laughs> for the existing facilities we, I mean, we, we've, I, we work very frequently I think the people in the office almost on a daily basis to work on scheduling for, for those cricket fields. The challenge is that the, the prime time is the prime time. That's when everyone wants to be on it, whether it's, whether it's soccer or lacrosse or cricket or ultimate frisbee or, or other programs that Parks and Rec wants to be on it. So there's a, there's a little bit of, of, of a trick in, 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 uh, in, in applying a level of fairness about who's going to use it. And, and how large the user groups are. So um, we've even, for, for the uh, folks that want to use the grass cricket pitch, we've even um, established rates that, that uh, make it more practical for them for times when it is off-peak. Um, because they assured us that uh, the wear and tear, while, while they need a large area, the wear and tear is relatively small. So we're, we're, we're trying to work with that group. It's a great opportunity, I agree, that, that uh, um, for, for both for people that are in this community and also we raise the rates for people from outside communities so they, they, they pay a much higher rate to use any of our facilities. Gotcha. Yeah. We need more, more playgrounds. But, yeah. but that's good. I, I was going to actually ask that. So we have a differentiated price uh, for in town versus... Absolutely. Uh, for, for, turf, for turf and for the, the, for, for the grass. There's actually well. three levels of pricing. There's, there's the out-of-town rate, which is a premium rate, mm -hmm. and then there's an in-town rate then there's an in-town rate for nonprofit. Oh. So we actually have groups in town that are private businesses with mostly Hopkinton residents. They actually pay slightly more than, say, um, an in-town nonprofit organization. So how does that work? I thought I was told that, you know, at least for the in-town versus out-of-town, that the rate had to be what it costs us to operate, and we couldn't. We couldn't operate it, you know, quote unquote, for profit uh, with any one group versus another. 
and so the rate had to be the rate. I thought that's what I was told a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. Sonic, I, I, don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, I think that I think that this way is the way it should be. Yeah, about the yeah. day. Um, but it's a it's a tricky balance, right? Because people people feel like, hey, listen, I pay pretty high property taxes. Why do I have to pay an additional fee to play on fields that are owned by the town? But yet, there's a cost to maintain those fields. Yeah. So we we do, we, and we try and price it. Um, as you know, we, we try to make it as fair as we possibly can. We we do some we do a lot of calculus on that to determine what does it cost to maintain this grass. Okay, mm -hmm. it costs eighteen thousand dollars a year. So, what do I need from cricket, and what do I need from soccer, and what do I need to cover that cost? So you start to back into a rate mm -hmm. by going through that exercise, and you try and come to an understanding with all parties of, of what's fair and and. and and with full disclosure of what you're trying to accomplish, so and I think we've I think we've done a good yeah. Job. And with the turf, it, Todd, it's a little bit of a line drawing exercise. Where do you do you try to recover some of the costs of the people that are running the schedules and doing the billing and the invoices and, and the negotiation and the contracts? Do you start to try to cover a cost for Absolutely. lining the fields and maintenance? Do you start to try to recover a cost? For field replenish uh, replacement that might take that, that might and, and then even that is a is a is a tough thing to gauge because we know of fields that need to be replaced in eight years and we and and we're targeting 14 yeah. years yeah. for our fields because we're keeping them in such good shape and and and, and staying on top of maintenance so it, it it's, it's hard but um, I don't I, I I hope that we're doing the right thing when it comes to having in town and out of town rates to to put it even more. To make it even more kind of clear, if I take in eighty thousand dollars on Fruit Street revenue, sixty of that will come in four weekends from outside soccer tournaments. Four or five weekends. That'll that'll usually come out to about sixty grand. Mm -hmm. So we we got to find another twenty, right, from the other groups in town. So that's kind of the ratio. Okay. Um, if not for these private soccer groups that hold that that hold these enormous tournaments, I don't know what we'd do. I really don't. Because that is the really the bulk of the money we take in on those fields. I think that's smart. I mean, if we have enough demand, I mean, we want to get revenue and provide that as a service to the town people more, uh, right. even if yeah. subsidized form. And, the, and, the, and it was, so then the challenge becomes, <laughs> oh, oh, we love $175 an hour more than we love $90 an hour, right? So let's have these out-of-town groups come in. And, 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 and it, it's still a balancing act because the, the people that should have the priority are the people from in, in town. And then just a little bit about, about market rates. Um, our rate for in-town people, uh, uh, in-town in groups, is, is high relative to other towns, I think. That's the feedback that we end up getting. And, uh, and our rates for out-of-town folks are, are at the top of what the um, private for-profit facilities are getting. So um, we're, I, I feel like we're pushing it in both ways, uh, for, for both groups, with an eye towards having as much in that fund towards replacement as possible when, when the time comes. Mm -hmm. have, have we actually benchmarked the town both I guess benchmark similar towns, similar similar condition facilities, but also what costs are involved. In Believe it or not, there's very few towns that have a facility like that, with both two, two full size turf fields and two full size grass fields. So it, it's hard to benchmark. And, um, and, and the thing you run it, it's, it's this is a, it, it's interesting because. Medway, for example, when we were looking at the turf fields at the high school and we went to visit the high school in Medway to find out how they got it done, how they did it with CPC, how they priced things and all that, they, they have, a, a, I think, a stated goal that they need to put a million dollars in the bank in 10 years from operating these, these fields. To replace so, the fields. To replace the fields. Um, then the lacrosse group didn't like the fact that they were paying... $75 an hour, let's say. They thought that that meant that they had to raise their prices for youth lacrosse to a point where it wasn't practical. They got people elected for the Parks and Rec Commission who adjusted the rate to $30 for in-town people. So now you've got competing goals there. You, yep, we kept the prices down for, for, for the people here in town that, that, that helped fund the field, and I understand that argument, but 
they're not getting a million dollars in 10 years, not, not unless they, they start renting it to people at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> not enough hours in the in, in the year the, here in New England. The other thing we're really working on doing, and and we're, we got a little bit of a roadblock with Eversource, is we want to put lights in down there. If we put lights in down there, we can we can increase revenues down there by I think up to 30, 35 percent. Um, we just have an issue with Eversource supplying power, unfortunately. So that's something we have to we have to work around. Um, but. I want to make sure you we want a tight ROI before you commit to that. But yeah, yeah, we, we actually have CPC, CPC funding for the for the lights. Um, have we done it last, last year? Oh, oh, last year. Already, but but uh, it, 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 it's a matter of getting the get enough juice to the to the field. And, and well, that, was, that was something about. that was researched with EverSource what maybe two or three years ago. I remember on the board of selectmen we talked to them about that. It's, it's going to be exorbitant. Yeah, it's very exorbitant. That's, and they're notoriously yeah, first answer. Notor notoriously difficult to work with. Yeah. Um, even in just getting power to the little, you know, shack we built up there, it took months. The nice part about well, I don't have to. I don't have to uh, step off the stage here if I ask you. Can we just do solar and power it by solar? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> just about everyone else does. Uh, but yeah, so you know. If we could ever get that project completed, I think that would go a long way. Uh, on the numbers, the water and sewer, that seems uh, jumping up and down. It, is there a water and sewer? I'm trying, is that on the expense side? Yeah, electricity, water, sewer, five to nine, then six, then again nine. That's a number that I have no control over. I see. So that's, that's an assessment. Uh, but for the actuals, what are the variables? My, uh, just to get get a feel for it. Excuse me. Like, what are the variables that's causing this going up and down? Uh, I honestly don't know. <laughs> do irrigate? Do you irrigate? Do you use more water in dry times, or do you? We we use. I mean, you know, we use water on the common, and we use water at the common. We use water at EMC Park, Carrigan, and we use water at Fruit Street. Um, but it's well water it's, and, yeah, um, it's um, at, at the common in Fruit Street. Fruit Street and the common has a well, so I, we don't use a lot of water. So I, I all the leaks it, and don't forget all the leaks in the center school heating system. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. right. But <laughs> could be Sandy Beach, and it could even be it. It, it could even be timing of bills. The way that yeah. yeah, we're 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 getting better and better at the accounting side of things. I think. And the debt service also went down. Is I think yeah. Dave, Dave could probably speak to the debt service. So the, the debt service has been is one of those principal. You pay off the principal, so that the interest, well, you don't accumulate as much interest, so it's a decline right. principal. So that's what's happened with this particular one. Right. Yeah. It's just last three years it didn't drop that much. I'm glad that it's dropping. You think it's oh, going to sustain yeah, that level? I'm not sure if it was just because someone wasn't catching it. Oh, it could be an accuracy okay. thing. Yeah, it just could have been being carried. Okay. I don't know. Gotcha. Yeah, I was just thinking. Hopefully, it stays there. <laughs> yeah, the the, the, the the beautiful thing about this enterprise fund is for for debt expense and indirect costs. The finance department tells me the number, and I plug it in basically. So, all of that's being reviewed, by the way, and right. the course of the next year. The indirect, indirect cost structures right. have to be re-examined. Re it's been over three years since the last study was done. Gotcha. So we'll be doing that in FY20, pre preparing for 21. Across the board. Across the board. Is Across the board. board. That's okay. correct. Good. Okay. It looks like the park and rec debt will be paid off in 23, right? You know, is, that for, is that the Sandy Beach the debt? Yes. Well, that's what you have. Yeah. And sorry, are you looking at the CPC borrowing? Is that what you said? Okay. At the Parks and Recs Fund Debt Service chart. Sure. It's in the approach report. Okay. Any other questions, guys, about this? Yes. So if I could just make a comment. So, um, and, and I don't know why they went this route, but Normally, and if you talk to like 
all the communities in Massachusetts, you would not hear anyone say that they have a park and rec enterprise fund, that they would operate it differently just because they, they would want to have um, participation going on and it's difficult to run an enterprise fund, which is a business entity versus a, a revolving fund where they could set participation fees equal to what they really need to collect. Enterprise funds can earn up to a 6% profit each year by law. So there is a little bit of a, you know, they could do that, but I think that they would lose. Their mission is to get people to participate by having to, you know, by charging that high or trying to recoup everything. So um, that's why in a lot of circumstances with park and rec systems, they have a lot of town participation that goes on. Um, this, the enterprise thing sort of puts up a little bit of a barrier to how much, how much does the town, hmm. you know, want to expose, you know, expose and just say we want to participate fully. It is an enterprise fund. So there's that. Um, not that you can't cross lines and come to an agreement because we are doing a subsidy mm -hmm. already. You just have to come to a gathering and say this is the way we're running things. Okay. So, so if you want to go into the history of why we have an enterprise fund, I'm sure Dan and yeah. Jay, you're familiar there, with it. That there's pros and cons. Your predecessor uh, yeah. uh, essentially, you know, it was going to be a self-sustained. It wasn't going to involve any. Uh, uh, subsidy by the town and that was yeah. the goal to make it self-sustained I think maybe it was four years ago when you said that really wasn't gonna be possible that it was going to be this is a service for the town and, yes. and right. um, I think that started you know when we put the money in for the the beach you know right. five hundred thousand a million dollars for the beach and then we were I, gonna get money back and I know you look at the revenue for the permits that's I think it's back. I, yeah, I think for water and sewer and enterprise fund, it's really easy to get to, to net zero. You know, I think for parks and rec, it's just, I think it's a really hard thing to accomplish. Because if, if it's, if you, if you want to increase rates to increase your revenues to cover your costs, people are going to stop participating. It's, it's like anything else. There's a, there's a point of diminishing returns, I think, on, on all that. But, you know, I, like I said, there's pros and cons to an enterprise fund. The pros are it's easy to track your expenses. It's easy. It's it's easy to do a P&L. Um, but I also understand like most of my peers in the industry do operate off a revolving fund, and it's it's easier. It's definitely easier for the. I think it's probably a lot easier for town town finance. Um, yeah. But I don't know. Plus exposure. Yeah. To the DOR. If there's a recommendation or a or a uh, uh, or a recommendation to go through a process to to look at this decision, then then I'd, I'd support that. Sure. I, I mean, the fact that the town's already offering a subsidy is we the town recognizes yeah. that you know we we want people to to participate. I can't speak to you know anything beyond that. Yeah. You know, I think that has to be the to talk with the town manager and talk with the board yeah. selectmen and see uh, what kind of receptiveness they have. I'm, I'm biased, but I feel like $150,000 for a, a robust parks and recreation department in a town this size is a pretty good deal. Um, I think we do a pretty good job of providing the residents with a pretty full array of, of programming and, and open space to enjoy. Um, but again, I'm I'm biased, and so is Dan. <laughs> we work hard. We do work hard at, at managing our expenses, and and we're not, you know, we're never frivolous, and we're never uh, irresponsible with 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 what we're trying to do. Yeah. I think participation is the larger success factor, certainly. But we also want to manage the cost. Sure. But I think it might be a good idea to look at, you know, from uh, the overall budgetary perspective, if it makes sense to go the other way. We'll, we'll convey that to the town manager. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. All right.
Thanks. Okay. Okay, next on the agenda is uh, our uh, appropriation committee town, re town meeting report discussion. Great. We provided you a draft yesterday, uh, late yesterday afternoon, early yesterday evening, as we said we would. And it's in many respects similar to the previous years, but we think we made some significant improvements in it. We included some sections on some of the topics we discussed, like the pension and a slightly different cut on the OPEB. Uh, I'm going to call up my copy here. And uh, we included some information on the investments that the, uh, the OPEB is involved with and the other trust funds are involved in. And uh, really are at this point providing that to you as a first exposure draft to see if you have any uh, feedback. And really, we th I think the biggest change is the, all the information on the debt. And when you look at the long-term health of the town and capital planning, you really need a clear picture of the debt. So probably that slide on page uh, 20 that shows what the general fund debt service looks like is the most illustrative. And it has the three lines. The solid blue line on the bottom shows the actual debt that's been issued. The next one shows the things that are authorized that we think are going to be issued and at the rates we think they're going to be issued at. And then the top line, the thin fine line, is uh, what the debt would be if everything going to the town meeting is approved, you know, the fire truck and the other capital articles. So that you, you really see where, how the debt tails off. I think we're going to add the data charts that build these uh, graphs in the appendix. Uh, so people can see year by year what the numbers actually look like. The graphs are good, but we took them from landscape legal size to portrait, and we lost some of the precision in the, in the scale on the x-axis. And really the question there is what is, the, what is the normal level of debt service that a town with our budget and our size should have and then what opportunities does that create for addressing deferred maintenance and recapitalization and growth right. new things you may want to do or think about or recommend yeah and, and just to clarify you have included authorized unissued right not issued not authorized have you included anything in there actually? that's those are the things that are in the warrant this year okay. so that's the things that are we believe will be going to the town meeting for consideration. And so you can see if everything on the warrant gets approved, that's how the debt line changed. We thought that was a pretty good thing to show. Yeah, that's good. On some of these um, debt service charts, can we go, uh, can we start the chart five years back at least? Mm -hmm. So that way people don't just see where we are and that, okay, it's going to be getting lower in future years because future years it's only going to get lower if we don't have town meeting. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, we can try to do that. I think we can. I don't see why we can't do that as long as the data is all consistent. We don't want to skip data sets. So I think we have the data set going back at least a couple of years mm -hmm. as one common data set. I don't know how old the data set is. And if there was a cutover, I don't want to try to cobble together two data sets. But yeah, but things like, things like, you know, CPA, you know, we should, that should be. Pretty, pretty easy one to track okay. over the years. That's, so. that's a good suggestion, and we'll take a look at that. Thanks. And get on. I think we have the actual debt service for the prior years because we have we've been doing this for yes years. So that yeah, it it's definitely sure. can be achieved. I just don't know how. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and like I say, I'm I'm only thinking because when we see this, it just. It, it looks like everything is rosy and oh yeah see in a few years everything's going to be great and, and it doesn't offer any perspective it doesn't show that maybe three years ago there was a spike right and we've been good over the last couple of years and you know if we keep being good it's going to keep going down or it doesn't show if hey before last year you know we were down here and all of a sudden now it's up here right well so. i do believe 
before we had the school, the library, and the DPW, we were at around $3 million. Yeah. So okay. it's, it went up from three to six, and now it's yeah. uh, making its way. Yeah, it went, it went up to nine in, in uh, the high, the peak here. So, yeah. Thanks. so we'll, we'll, we will do that. And Tim, is there a list of the items that constitutes this somewhere? Yes, Appendix C, I think, in the very last pages of the document. And Ben can correct me if I think that's exactly what's in there. Uh, but it only shows for the five years out. But we do have the complete table. Uh, so this shows the debt service for a few years, and that's a format that was in last year. But we absolutely have the full table by detail. It's a 363-line spreadsheet that shows every sub-borrowing for every project. And well, I will absolutely share that with you. And if you can think of a way that we can include that without turning it into a 100-page report, uh, and maybe that's the kind of thing we should just have on our website and point to it in the report, you know what I mean? Maybe some categorically, uh, some categorization of the debts could it help. Segregates it segregates it. You know, the titles of the borrowings are hard to track to some of the specific projects. At least as new people, all three of us being new, that's the experience we've had where you can't look at a description, you know, which is typically in column B or C, right, and, and identify that this goes to the turf field or this goes to a fruit street project. Or, so uh, the vocabulary is, is not as friendly as it might be. I see. But, but that should be easier to solve. I mean, Norman. It's doable. <laughs> it's doable. It's a lot of history. Yeah. The translation can occur. Now, yeah, because I would like to kind of look at it, yeah, if you can send it over, especially what are the capital items we have in the queue that we have included, right? Um, so that would be that second line, and right. we'll, we'll share that sheet with you as well. Sure. And again, we're trying to f figure out what's the right level of detail to present. We certainly want to share everything with you, and we want you to have a, any set of data you want. Uh, a lot. We have a lot of information that we put out, like uh, I think in the annual report last year when I was scanning through it, we saw that somebody spent $7.32 on a rubber stamp on July 8th. And that's totally meaningless information to anybody. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't tell anybody anything. It doesn't help understand the cost of a program or the value proposition. It's just information that's being put out because everybody wants to be totally transparent. So if we can take some of this inf information or this data and turn it into useful information, that's really what we'd like to do. And, you know, any ideas you have about how to do that are, are very much appreciated. Sure. And on that uh, same note, Tim, do we have a similar with the total outstanding debt? Yes. So we have it by fund, and that, that chart is the product of that data set. So what underlies that chart uh, on page 20 is that data set. That's right. all the outstanding debt in the general fund, and then we have a cluster for parks and recs, water and sewer. Mm -hmm. And that's all data that we use to build those charts. Okay. Yeah, what I'm, I was saying is this is for the debt services. Right. Oh, the actual debt. The actual yes. debt. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we have that. You know, it's funny. We've been having that discussion yeah. over and over again, and I missed your yeah, no, no. cue on that. So that's the... Uh, we show it for the current year in one of the two pie charts. People love pie charts, mm -hmm. so we kept two. And they're on about 16 or 17. And one of them is the debt service pie chart, and one of them is the debt pie chart. So the debt service pie chart on page... 18 and 19. 18, yeah. 18 shows the uh, debt and interest for all the funds... And then 19 shows all the debt for all the funds. So it's $94 million uh, in debt and interest. That's outstanding. Oh, I see 94.2, yeah. So I'm looking at the tax impact versus inflation chart. Great. And for fiscal year 20, how would you come out with 1.5%? I went, I went to the U.S. Department of Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics website, 
that was footnoted in last year's report. And uh, I took a rolling 12-month average off there, which I think I footnoted there underneath the chart. So that's what DOL is saying right now. So I don't think we, I don't know if we predicted what it was going to be next year. I think we just kind of said this is what it currently, you know, for year, year over year at this time, because... Well, that's, that's what that number is, and maybe it's titling and headings, but I think that's how it was done last year, because you, you can't know but what we took. It, we, we know what the tax impact is going to be next year now, and we know what the inflation rate is, the 12-month rolling inflation rate is. So we can improve that footnote if there's specific words you like. Because I remember last year, they were, what's the inflation rate? I knew exactly, you know, I looked it up and said at this time, you know, because it goes by month by month. Right, so right. for the month of May, year over year, it was 3%. At, okay. that, at this particular time, it wasn't a projection. It was what it actually is. And that's right. the, that, and that is what it is for the last 12 months. It is. According to the PL. Yeah, fuel's down. Energy's down. So they break it out by components, and then there's all CPI. Well, the next month it's going to go up, so fuel's back up. If it goes up <laughs> next month, usually fuel goes up in October. But, uh, or maybe the summer driving months. Is that what you're thinking? Well, the price of it's already fuel. Go to the gas station and look at the, the price, price of fuel. Price of fuel. Uh, you know, I, I drive a Land Cruiser, I don't even look. <laughs> I look the other way when I pump. So. Uh, if you want, I'll send you the link for that. Okay. And certainly we can change the footnote and use a different computation. We know that's a popular chart and we wanted to keep it. Well, I like the chart. I don't know if others like it. Well, if it's popular with you, it's popular with us. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all like it, Mike. So we're really looking at the narrative. You can see in the, there's a detail section and there was some narrative and some of it talked about goals, some of it talked about change. We're, we want to restructure uh, the message there. So we tell a common message across all the departments and, and uh, have a common sequence and common look and feel. And we want to try to blend in some, uh, a little bit of start on some performance metrics. And in the long run, we'd really like to see a heavy emphasis on performance metrics discussed in the context of spending. So we're trying to make some progress in that direction in the next few days to at least take some baby steps in that direction. So we're open to any uh, you know comments by by email, by by phone, by uh, comment boxes on the document. Uh, again, a couple things we just wanted to really put on the record: we have short-term funds that are invested mostly in uh, de you know demand deposits, uh, basically money market funds or municipal depository trust funds, and those are really safe and really liquid and they have very low returns and then we have the stabilization funds that we really want some availability to and we have those in about 30 percent equities and about 70 percent more stable investments so we're trying to capture some market return in those stabilization funds uh, but not we you know when we need them will probably be during a market downturn Mm -hmm. So we really want to think about how much of those stabilization funds we have in equities. And then in the OPEB, which is a long-term liability we're trying to address, we have that 55% in equities. So I try to do some benchmarking to see what other people have for their averages. Florida runs a state fund for OPEBs, and they let people invest either 50, 60, or 70% in equities. So there are people who are taking quite a bit more market aggressive position on their OPEB than we are. Uh, I, I don't know that I would recommend going beyond the 55. And in fact, 
when everybody was talking about recessions a couple of weeks ago, I was starting to get nervous about the 55. So we're op really open to any ideas about what our risk profile would be. Really, our investment advisors can give us the right batch of investments to meet our risk profile, but they can't tell us what our risk profile is. We have to decide that. We have to decide how much we want to chase market returns in these funds and how much we value uh, safety and liquidity ahead of those market returns. So, yeah. And I, we thought it was good to bring this discussion in. This is, it's always, the, this document's been focused mostly on the spending side. And we really want to talk about the whole financial stewardship piece a little bit more. And this is helpful. I think we could add some more visuals, but we'll think about that. Mm -hmm. Some more visuals um, in terms of kind of expressing some of the information trends. Uh, but we'll think about that and get okay. back to you. Great. Uh, and uh, one question about the our uh, investment distribution portfolio. Do we have any financial advisory that we go to it time to time? We do. The town treasurer is responsible for investments, part of his statutory duty, and he has hired a firm, I believe they're headquartered in Worcester, uh, Bartholomew and Company, and we've been with them since October of, October of 17, I think. October of 17. And uh, so uh, our stewardship role is to assess whether they are delivering the kind of returns like customers are getting for us and what their costs are. And they're a pretty low cost provider of service and uh, we're assessing the kind of returns we're getting that other people are getting from like portfolios. So that's something we think we should start doing on a, on a really a periodic basis. We should have a formalized method of assessing the performance of those funds. Uh, we're also looking at the general deposits we have. We have some in banks and we have some of the depository trust and we're looking at that strategy to determine what the proper mix is, uh, what the proper mix is there. There's an argument that we need some funds with some banks who buy our debt and who support us in a debt way as kind of a business partnership arrangement, but we probably don't need to have more money uh, then gets us gets our debt served, and our debt is very attractive because of our bond rating. So uh, that's another strategy point that we're looking at. How do we maximize the return on that those funds? And so you know we have a kind of a sawtooth pattern of our revenue. Property taxes spike for us twice a year, and then our expenditure line is more steady throughout the year because it's seventy five percent payroll and. You know, debt service is another big component of it. So our expense line is very steady and our revenue line is spiked. So in a given month, we might have $35 million in deposit accounts. So it's uh, <clears throat> well worth our attention to make sure that that money, even if it's a percent or 2%, that we're getting what we can get out of that while serving our need for security and liquidity. Any questions or comments on the, on the report? Okay, so we're going to continue with the narrative section. Uh, we'll, we'll look out for any comments or additional questions you have. But uh, I think what you have is, in some ways, a 95% report compared to last year, and in some ways, a 150% report, because there's new sections that provide new uh, analysis and new insights. And all the things that were there before are still there, and they're substantially complete except for the narrative. And really what we're working on is how do we tell the value proposition story? Because this is a, you know, we, we deliver a great value to the taxpayer. You just heard the Parks and Rec talk about the value they're delivering, and the whole town is a great value proposition. And if there's something that hit me as a new member of the team, it's that we probably under communicate the really good things we do, how successful we are at tax collection, how few people actually appeal their tax uh, rates, uh, how people participate and benefit from our programs and services. And we tend to tell those stories in two different ways. We do this report and talk about the money, and then we have more segregated discussions about 
whether the town's a good or bad value, and they're really obviously linked together. Because when you buy anything, whether it's an education or a car or a vacation, you're looking at the cost and the value. So the, to the extent that we can link that more in this year and in coming years, uh, that's really a high priority for us. Nothing to do with content. How do we determine, uh, or I guess, what are the regulations and how do we determine how many copies of the, the report we make available in the night of town meeting? Because obviously we want everybody who wants one to have access, whether it's online right. or, or you know a hard copy. And you can't really determine who has access online. Um, but it makes me sick every year when I see how much paper you know, is just wasted at the end of the night. So we'll, I don't, I'll find out what we can know if, yeah, if there's a you definitive know, I, answer I know it's that. not a scientific answer to come up with the right number, but. Right. Um, uh, you know, I think by putting it out in advance, trying to make it available to as many people as possible uh, is, is one thing we can do. But you're right, we don't want to have anybody come in and not be able to get a report. If there's content that you think is in here that doesn't need to be in there, you know, this is kind of like grandma's basement. Things have gotten added over years and years and years, and we're trying to take a fresh look at it. And you know, maybe there are some some detail levels of detail that that aren't valuable. I, this is actually only like our third year of putting out this kind of comprehensive report. Okay, so. I'd like to think that the standard is that it's at least worth the paper it's printed on. Yeah, the information is at least worth the paper it's printed on. So. So, uh, okay. All right, so we have two meetings next week, and I guess uh, Tuesday would really be a final edit look at this, and we'll try to bang it out, and then Thursday will be a public hearing on this report, and you'll take a vote on the report at that time, and we'll be well ahead of schedule, and you'll have completed your duty. So it's next Thursday is the public hearing? Oh, yes. And it's already posted? Correct. Okay. And what, what's on the agenda for Tuesday? The re I think the report, just, that's it? Right. Okay. And, and when do we have the votes for the yeah. ones? When do we vote on? So you didn't want to vote on the report till after the hearing. Well, not the report. We have to make motions on all the, uh, all the articles. Okay. So this was a question I was going to bring up because we usually had Pam to guide us through this process. But did we need the motion, a motions document, which is, I guess, the warrant? Was that approved last night? The warrant or, or was night? partially approved last night. They didn't approve all the articles. So the articles haven't even been approved yet by the selectmen. So, but we used to have a motions document or did you just have a you know i'll say a cheat sheet just for each one based on the warrant itself i'm talking to you, i'm looking at you wayne because i know you you were the one who i don't have pam script i was read it off her script well i'm sure we could but did, you, did we have a motion do you, do you recall if we had a motions document at that time or we were just doing it based on the warrant I remember doing it. She had a, the cheat sheet she had made, and we were using a warrant for the details. We could have somebody have the warrant. And I was in here last year because I was looking mm -hmm. at an airliner, but the year before. Was. Okay. Yeah, usually she created a cheat sheet or summary of the warrants. Yeah. But who prepared the warrants? I thought uh, uh, well, our um, finance helped with that. Well, the, the fi financial articles, but you know, you go through. Uh, uh, the attorneys who help generate the warrant, but when we approve that, we want to pretty much use the same wording. You know, we don't. We have to know the numbers. We have to know, and that's not in the general warrant itself. That'll be in the motions document. So that's why I'm wondering: Do we have to wait? I think we could do some of them, but I don't think we have the actual numbers. Um, yeah, and and I'm just trying to remember the process of when we started. We start pretty early, but I'm wondering if we had the motions document pretty early on. But it is still pretty, it is actually, we're, still, we're a little more than, less than a month away, so I think we're actually in better shape than we were in previously, because we would be doing it right around the public mm -hmm. hearing, which would be like mm -hmm. next week, I think, or even after that, when we would start uh, plowing through the, the articles. But that's what we're talking, that's the piece that we have to do, and sometimes that does take some time, just because there are so many of them, and... Right. Um, 
So the Board of Selectmen are going to approve the final articles on the 23rd, and we will try to, f we will find out uh, how your piece fits in there. This is a new thing for me, so I'll, I'll find out what the institutional memory is on that, and we'll, we'll get back to you on that point. So, Mr. Chair, my other question is, um, you know, when do we have any conversation on the budget? Gone through a number of meetings with different departments, listened to what they had to say. I understand that this committee doesn't have any direct authority over the okay. budget, but um, in the past, I know that recommendations have come out, but that's got to have conversation, right? <laughs> okay, we can definitely. I think uh, we can do that any time. We're still discussing the budget. We're discussing the budget message, so I think at any time we can discuss that, or especially if we want to send a message back to the board of selectmen. I don't know when they're next. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, well, it's the 23rd. Uh, we, we left space for that in the budget message of your report. And uh, I would think now or next Tuesday night would be the time for you to talk among each other to try to give us more direction on this report. Yeah, I think so. to make it a little more structured, we could use next meeting's time and go over department by department and collect our thoughts, recommendations, or any further discussions, mm -hmm. and then farm it up from there. Yeah. And the other question is, I know we talked to a lot of departments, but, you know, we didn't, there was no discussion on the library, um, health services, youth services, if there was any, I mean, that's a, because it's a smaller piece, there's no capital articles, it's a much smaller part of the budget. If anyone has any questions, we also can ask about that in terms of the operation and the costs. And uh, in general, we had questions, and we could ask questions in the past, and we can get answers on that, even though they're not actually here. If there are things in that section that would call into question your support for the budget, which is, the, I think, the main question at hand, is whether you're going to endorse the budget. That's the question. Is uh, And we can get more people or more information. We'll do whatever it takes on any time frame to give you what you need to make that determination. Yeah, and I guess I'll just say out front, um, you know, when, when we start having that discussion for people to chew on, um, one of my concerns is uh, it seems like from our operational budget, which is where we're measuring all of our metrics, you know, in terms of percentages and things like that, my understanding is that we're starting to pull things out of that, but then putting them into pay as you go so that we can hit these other metrics that were, um, I'll say mandated, but requested in the budget message. And I don't, I don't know that in all cases that was really uh, the spirit of the message. <laughs> you know? um, Let's take, let's take the measurable, you know, where we're measuring percentages and start, you know, taking stuff out. Still spend the money, but spend it in a different way. And so um, that's, that's one of my concerns. And I think that over the last few years, there's been a lot of discussion over certain things. And I'll just, I'll use police cruisers as an example. You know, we know we got to buy three every year. Um, and, you know, while I was on the Board of Selectmen, it was in the pay-as-you-go every year. But there was always a discussion, should it be in pay-as-you-go or should this be operational because we know that we got to do it every year. Kind of like, I don't know, um, I, I can't even come up with any example, you know, uh, as an analogy. But, um, you know, those are, that's, that's my big concern. Um, you know, I can't say that any of the presentations that were given by the departments over the last couple of weeks are incredibly concerning, um, but it's more, I guess, the policy uh, and, and I guess what the spirit of the policy is and whether we're adhering to that. So I'll just uh, give it, you know, a def little defense of the budget uh, on, you know, on behalf of the staff, the staff perspective. So your point is very well taken, but I would argue that the pay-as-you-go and the operating budget are both funded from current resources, right? The pay-as-you-go comes from, really, from the free cash that flows through from the previous years. So I wouldn't particularly, I, I'm not particularly focused on the line between pay-go and the departmental budgets. 
What I'm focused on is the line between that and borrowing. So if we were bundling five cruisers and borrowing that, then I think your your concern would be very would be more a more intense concern, right? Well, I would definitely say it would be more yeah. intense. I'm yes. not saying this wipes it out, but right. <laughs> so so I think you know the, the the delineation between the departmental budgets and the pay as you go is kind of an artificial delineation. Really, what's important is that the pay go is non recurring items. And what you keep in the uh, what you keep in the departmental budgets is recurring. So what would trouble me is if we started paying for staff out of the pay as you go, or if we started bundling things that should be in pay as you go into uh, borrowing. And we're really not seeing that. Here. Yeah. Well, you know, just just yeah. for argumentative sake, um, as as I tend to do, um, if you're buying three cruisers each year. They may not be the same cruisers, but it's kind of repetitive, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. it, just just so. from a historical perspective, I can't recall. I don't think we, we've always wanted to get the cruisers, the police cruisers, into the operational budget because there is an annual thing, but I don't think we actually did it, unless it was last year. No, I know. No, we, but we haven't. And I think this year was the first, I think, you know, were. foray into that, into that world, and then... I think, I think they were snagged, and but, you know, I don't know if anything else. But what it does do is it gives us the flexibility. If it's not in the operational budget, if you have pays you go next year, we don't have as much uh, free cash available, then we get two or one, you know, or you know, just a, you have that kind of flexibility. But I, I do agree with, in general, with what you're saying, and I do think you know we've always tried to make sure that as as. Tim is saying we try to make sure that if it's a recurring item, uh, that we don't put it in, um, that we don't borrow. Yeah, and, and that was my concern specifically when I brought up the uh, the security stuff because we've had like this five year plan of, you know, of adding security and all of a sudden now we're borrowing. You know, basically it's a five year borrow. I don't know if it was five year. So if every year we're, it's a five year plan, every year we're borrowing to pay it off in five years. It, 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 and I think the Mormon's yeah. response was that this was the final year of this plan. You know that, so it is not. And, and if I want to argue your side, I would also say that um, while if the cruisers are in operational, um, there's more you know funds available and pay as you go for other things. Um, the intent is to limit the spending and prioritization of that spending. And if the cruisers are a higher priority, then those other things that were being put into pay as you go, now when you move them over, there's stuff that's going to fall off the table anyway. I can make arguments on both sides. Um, you know, I just, uh, yeah. I, I just I have can a, make arguments you know, on both sides. <laughs> you know, when I'm looking at the same thing, I have concerns about the overall capital borrowing. You know, it's not like we have any big projects yet. We're still asking to borrow $4.3 million dollars for short-term borrowing, that to me is a, is a lot, and uh, mm -hmm. um, and I do have concerns there. And I understand the ladder truck is 1.2 million, and that is towards the getting towards the end of its life, and we have to be proactive about that. But you know, when you have 1.8 million for the sidewalks, and I know it's been put off for a couple of years, but we're still digesting uh, the taxes and, and the increase from from. The three big capital projects, the building. Yeah, and, uh, I agree. Yeah. So you're you're right that 70 percent of the total capital borrowing recommended is for those two projects, the sidewalk expansion and the ladder truck, and uh, those are exactly your, the concerns you're having and the thinking you're doing is exactly what needs to occur, and that's why those long-term debt charts are important to look at, and maybe when we add the Backfill it, it'll tell a different story and it'll, it'll help inform that. But you need to think about that top line that layers in on the long term debt chart. And we've shown it graphically, I think, for the first time. Yeah. So the information's there and it's a, an appropriate thing to consider. They're two big ticket things. And uh, I'm sorry, Tim, I, I don't have the long term debt chart up, but. Um, can we add some type of um, a reference point also, just uh, the constant line, uh, well, relatively constant of whatever the recommended debt, long-term debt level is? You know, I mean, if it's recommended that we don't go over 
Okay. Yeah. So we'll I put a dotted line it. through the middle at what the debt threshold yeah. is. Yeah. 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 Something like that. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's a great idea. But I thought isn't the overall, if you look in the financial plan, is the overall debt shouldn't be more than 10%. The debt service. That's the, that's the limit. That's, that's the nice. limit, I think. I, is the I, limit I read it today. Is the limit recommended? I th no, I think it's above. Or I think it's it maybe above. It's a legal limit. Right. So, but what's a healthy limit? Is it <laughs> sort of? We can. Well, that's what it's, it's no longer healthy if you go above ten percent. So, so there are certain <laughs> exceptions to that to, rule. To the ten percent rule. To the ten percent rule that the town applies to. I mean, um, has advantage of uh, any MSBA project doesn't lend to that. Thing. And so we have, I think, I believe we have two right. going at, at the current time. So that doesn't lend to that debt ceiling. Okay. And Tim, to Mike's point, I think the uh, debts that you have included as anticipated, right. it probably doesn't include all these growth-related or various uh, depreciation-related items that eventually we end up buying through uh, debt exclusions or uh, capital investments. So what it includes is the middle line includes things that have been approved already. Right. So it doesn't include the fact that there's a bad boiler in a building somewhere. So that, th this is where we really need to get where, you know, capital planning, the management of deferred right. maintenance, and the management of debt are all integrated. Yeah. A comprehensive and we get a yeah, common look that. at it. Right. And as uh, I think Todd, you were mentioning that every year, every other year we end up paying for three new vehicles or right. five new ones. But until we actually see that ask, we don't have it in our projection anywhere. So we did that one year, and they'll refer to it as the Ron Eldridge chart. And uh, oh, all right, that yeah. showed this was before we built any of the three buildings. That this was probably back in 2012 or 2013. And it just showed our debt going off the charts. And, uh, and that was so that didn't go over too well, but you know, because we it's not a just because we were showing, you know, this potentially what it was going to cost if when we built a new school, a new library, a DPW, okay, and the impact to the taxpayers. But you know, and, and that goes into what I, you know again talking about this budget that we went into town meeting saying we're going we want these projects. You know, I did a rough estimate that was going to add. You took it, you know, what we're paying, including you know. In, you know, contractual stuff in our budget it was going to add 10% these these three projects. So the fact that we're trying to squeeze it down to stay within you know prop two and a half or two or a two and a half percent impact is just a challenge. And I think, like you said, we're moving things out. We're trying to be. It's almost the point of being creative with the budget, and that's really because we should be. You know, last year we this was that was the last year, the big year of the increase, and it ended up being five percent. And I thought we were lucky to be at 5% because that was the year I think we all got hit at the same year. Almost all three projects went on a little bit the year before, but most of it was, if you look at the tax impact the year before, it wasn't, it was like 3%, but then it went up to 5%. I thought it was going to be a 7% hit because that's when we should have gotten that 10%. And again, we were, we were able to stretch things out and smooth things out a bit, but it, that's the challenge that we're saying we, we should. If we, if we just added the cost, what's the impact of the, the new school, the impact of the DPW, the impact of the library would have added about 10% to your, your, your taxes. And we're trying, and we try to smooth it out. As, as Tim has keeps saying, how do we space out these projects? But because they required state approval, we didn't have that luxury when they got approved. Then you had so many days to approve the project. And, and it kind of, they all ended up being the same time when they were completed. We may have approved them different years, but they were all completed like the same, like within a year of each other. And that's why it was such a harsh, harsh hit. But I, I, I'm concerned that we voted for all these things and now we don't want to pay, we, we, we're trying to find ways not to have to take that impact. And it's So, so we, difficult. this budget does pay for all those things. Yep. And it also, there's, there's new growth in this budget. There are new teachers, there are new firefighters, there's new police officers, there's a public health nurse. There is growth in this budget to reflect the growing demands on the town from the growing community. And uh, so that's also a good news story. We can look at it that way. We are doing a lot in this budget without a lot of impact 
because we have $2 million in new growth in the tax revenue from the new construction. So uh, that, that's really what has allowed us to soften the impact of some of these large capital uh, investments, maintain current services, and even add layers of service while minimizing uh, impact. I didn't write this budget, but I think I'm going to have to put it, whoever wrote it in for an award, because this is the, uh, on that level, a very successful budget. It, it lowers the water uh, in the lake. It takes out some of the slack in the system. It's a tighter budget, I think, than maybe has existed in past years, but it, it has met all the competing priorities and demands. And uh, I'm, it, it's remarkable that, that we were able to do so. My predecessors and my colleagues were able to do so before I got here. So I, so I am wondering if you do a modeling of next year's budget, you know, because they want to do an underwrite, I don't, we don't think we necessarily have to vote on whether we approve of the underwrite or not. But in the modeling, will, are we automatically going to be hit with having to decide on an override? So we have a five-year view in, in the draft report. And uh, it tells half of that story. And if you just look at the chart, the answer would be no. Everything's going to be fine next year. But what the numbers don't show is will there be another public health nurse? Will there be what's the what are the new demands for services that are not in these numbers yet? So we extrapolated the expense numbers forward in the in a credible and responsible way, but what's unknowable is what the community demand is going to be to have a five hundred thousand dollar anti vaping program or to have something with center school. Mm -hmm. That the, those new growth things are not in that column yet. Right. Now, yeah. uh, is that? That's correct. So, so that's what we're going to have to play with next year. So our 2022 projection has us funding uh, the OPEB at even a higher level. Sorry, the 2021 OPEB at a higher level, a higher level to stabilization. It has us covering all of our recurring costs. It has us covering our debt service. What we don't know is what the demands will be that will percolate up from the community for increased services, but it doesn't look like a disaster from here. No, I, I, I agree and appreciate all the effort that has been put together on this and, you know, make it as uh, good and as, uh, it's a well encompassing as possible. But at the same time, you'll see that uh, we are actually depending on that $2 million growth to balance the budget year after year. And $2 million, I think we did a quick calculation, is 200 new households, right? And that will include new students and new pressure on police, fire, DPW, yes. and all. Yes. And you extrapolate it to four years. Now you have, what, 800 new houses. Even 80% of them have students. You are looking at 600 new students or something like that, or 480. And do we need a new school at the time? Or do we need a new fire station at the time? Or how do we handle that? Right. And if we hit the other cycle and we don't get that two million extra, where do we cut our services then? Do we have those scenarios kind of analyzed or planned? I think those are the, I mean, some of the questions to ask and uh, see how better we can plan and manage for those. Yes, sir, you're absolutely right. We are projecting growth down in 2021 from 2 million to 1.8 million. Uh, you'd like to think that when growth goes down, the demand for services is going to be on a parallel glide path. I guess the worst case would be if services con demand continued to rise and revenue dropped. That would be a very difficult situation. Uh, I, I think that modeling the cost of student growth is the number one priority for the town to understand. Yeah. And it's, it's going to happen whether it happens in three years or five years or 12 years. It seems very clear that this is a highly desirable community. And until infill housing is no longer an option, uh, we're going to continue to have student growth. The trick is, what is the spread of the x-axis on that, right? So when do the next 100, 100, 100 students come in and how do we plan for that? And I would say many of the other things that we spend time looking at are much less important than that one question. 
And uh, I know everybody has an opinion on it, but I don't. I haven't met anyone yet who has the data on it. So uh, that's something we certainly hope to focus on this year. I mean, I thought the school, the schools had a very good chart when they showed here's the predicted uh, growth based on here's the build out of the the big projects. So they had I that range, which was I think but the range yeah. was almost 100 students. But I think you could do the same thing yeah. with. Um, here's what the new growth is going to be, because they did actual projections on how many buildings they were going to put in, so that could be the base. That's so the that, and that's the, the, that's the okay. kind of analysis that has to happen. So when you're looking at the growth, you have to look at the marginal cost of each student, which is not the average cost. It's very different from the average cost. As any big family can tell you, you can add another kid or two or a set of twins, but when you, when you take in seven new children, then you need a, another bathroom, two bathrooms, you need another laundry room. You need that's when you get to those lumpy points, right? So it's not linear. These costs are linear within relevant ranges, but they're very step functioned over over the larger uh, horizon. So, uh, and the increase, we need a more sophisticated understanding of those steps and also, when they kick in. But also, the increase or leveling depends on the economy too. If the housing housing market's strong, there's a lot of turnover, so therefore people are leaving and people with kids are coming in, but if the housing market cools for whatever reason, and it can probably turn on a dime, um, suddenly everything levels off or slows down for a couple of years, including the new, but then again, probably including the new growth too. And you just, how do you predict that? You can't really predict that out for so years. It, it needs a lot of work. I, I've heard people say we need more over 55 housing, and then I hear about this phenomenon where you build 55 housing and people move out of five bedroom homes into the 55 housing and then you get 12, you know, six kids moving into the five bedroom house. And so this is really something that we need to understand in a very deep way. And uh, I don't think we're there. And I, I will also say that most of the country and much of the state is struggling with the opposite problem. Declining values, fleeing populations, eroding tax base. And given my choice of which set of problems to work on, I would much rather work on this set of problems. I know everybody thinks the problem they have are the worst problems, but I think the, the officials of Flint, Michigan, or some other troubled communities would, would argue with that. So. These are not the worst problems to have. Well, and I think another, yeah, another question in all of it is, as you're going through the growth, the population growth, we know that there's the immediate, the immediate expense, but how much expense is lagging uh, for increase as well? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think some of that might, it, it's all going to be around those basic services, and. Um, I think that's something we have no idea about because eventually, you know, eventually we hit a point where there is no, there's less uh, dramatic concern about high growth because we run out of land. Space. Um, uh, but, you know, you're still going to have those trailing years where things are going to continue to rise. I think if you go to Northern California, and, and just walk through some of the communities there, like Livermore, California, or anywhere, and you see what's happening with infill housing, we are a long way from running out of, uh, out of opportunities for growth. Uh, but, and this is also like an oil tanker instead of a speedboat. Uh, we had policies in place here for years or decades that have brought us here. And it's, it's uh, I think there may be limited options in terms of how quickly and sharply we can turn this oil tanker. So. Uh. I, I think uh, the larger concern is we are using growth money to operate and without accommodating uh, the investment for growth. We, we used growth money, we used growth money to fund a lot of the new services that we're adding this year and I don't think it's unreasonable to say that there might be a dividend to the legacy owners, the, 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 the long-standing owners, let me be careful about the use of the word legacy, but by the long-standing owners from this growth. There, there is a growth dividend. 
I don't I don't know that we're ever going to need a bigger jail here. I mean, we're not going to we're not going to have a doubling of all of our costs. You know, our our jail is plenty big for the level of crime we have, and uh, so it's this is what we need to be working on over the next few years is to understand this growth phenomenon. Dave, you had something you wanted to add? I, it, so he, he's, to, to his point, we, in the overall picture, we, we are using, we are dependent upon uh, new growth. Mm -hmm. And um, responsiveness to the growth is happening in this year, as Tim spoke to. Um, the, we all have to remember that it, there's more resources that are available to the town. Um, that you know, we get state aid, we get local receipts. Um, this, these are all part of the process, and we also were using um, for the last, at least the last couple of years, we've had some great return on free cash. Okay, which is it's all part of how we build our budgets. Uh, you know, uh, it, are we mm -hmm. planning? adequately in our tech and our uh, budgeting structure so that we'll get a good return through good management fiscal responsibility and um, just the economy because people are doing things and paying fees over and above our conservativeness and estimate you know so it's part of the whole picture it's in my it is a big focus. New growth is a big picture here. There is a high dependency, but it's part of the big, it's part of the whole picture. We have to look at the whole exactly. thing together. Yeah, I agree. And, and I and think we, that's what Tim's talking yeah. to when he speaks that we have to look at. And we have most these segments yeah, to make right. sure that they're, they're going to mm -hmm. uh, maintain these levels of right, expectations. Yeah. I think we are resonating on the same, and we are all. You know, looking for that comprehensive plan, looking for that connected kind of budget and forecast and various models. And I'm not too worried about the jails, uh, as you mentioned, but more about the schools or right, yes. fire services or DPW, that Absolutely. more tangible and really relevant uh, services that impacts the quality quality of our lives. Yes, sir. Good discussion. Thank you. All right. Todd, is this the discussion you wanted? Um, uh, you didn't have to answer that. Tangential to it. <laughs> <laughs> when it's more specific, I'm sure you have <laughs> specific by departments. Is what you're talking. Yeah, you know, I mean, I just, I just assume that at some point we're going to talk about the budget, you know, very specifically about the budget and what the feelings are on that. So one way to do that would be at the next meeting to go through the section that has the line item appropriation and mm -hmm. the chair could walk through that and you, you could have a discussion. That would be a perfect template for it. Okay, we'll do that on Tuesday. Yeah, and, and if, you know, if that is not something that's happened in the past and it seems to be outside the purview, then no, that's we, fine too. We, we yeah. generally have, but there have been times when we've been asked to trim the half a percent off or one percent off or five fine five hundred thousand to yeah. trim off. So that's why we that's when we had really had to go off on each line item uh, yeah. one by one and uh, go through it. And the fact that I we're there at the number we we need it, are we looking to trim more off or are we looking it's really to ask the questions at this point or make sure you know everything's done. You know the, your eyes are dotted, your T's are crossed, and and there's nothing sticking out. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so we can have that in the next question. Yeah. 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 Any other questions or comments? Are we ready to adjourn? I have a question outside of this. Do we provide a car for the assessors department? There are town cars that are available to them to use. They don't have a, a dedicated vehicle. Okay. So we can either pay the mileage or we can pay, they can be in a town car. And I think they have magnetic. Uh, okay, that explains that it. Because I saw a very new Audi A6 with town assessor's office on it. Right. So I assume that's a personal car. We're not providing that. 
with the, which what, what kind of vehicle was it? It was a newer Audi A6. Yeah, that would wonderful be a, car, that would not, not be a town not car. Not for tax. <laughs> I say that with a high degree of certainty. <laughs> That's the finance director's car. Okay, that, I just I I, I yeah. knew we had it, but I saw that and I thought it was worth asking. Right. That that is maybe not the best. Maybe we should rent them a Yugo or something. I was going to think just a matter of the assessors driving. Right? See that down, yeah. down in Florida that um, uh, there's a police department that's been buying Teslas. And, um, you know, they've been, like, repossessed Teslas and things like that. And they say that it isn't much more expensive than the cars that they were getting before. But the on gas. taxpayers aren't all that happy. Yeah. Yeah. Summit County, Colorado, went to all Mercedes SUVs 20 years ago and argued, you know, had the similar arguments that it was an effective move and people just didn't like it. Okay. So we have not done that. Okay. Nor, nor will we. Nor will we. That's, that's our procurement manager. <laughs> All right, we're ready to adjourn. All those in favor of adjourning for the evening, say aye. 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 Nay. Thank you. Four zero. We are done. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening.